Tell us about Grow Intelligence, the work you're doing, uh, and why you're doing it. Yeah, um, Grow Intelligence is a company I, I founded um, in 2014, and it really is a story at the end of the day that tells the story of what on earth is going on. Um, and I say that because, you know, oftentimes we use data to, to tell stories. Um, and oftentimes when we think of earth, it, you know, we think of satellite images just showing us pictures of our earth, whereas earth is sort of this interplay between our Earth's actual ecology and our human economy and the interrelationships between the two. And what we've done is we've built um, a data platform using artificial intelligence to capture sort of data around the world about our Earth as well as our human economy, connect the dots and start to tell stories about things like you know, where the trajectory of food security is going or mm-hmm. how to um, become better resilient to climate change. Um, and, and really, it's a company focused on tackling these two major problems, which is essentially around food security and climate change at a global scale. Huge issues, right, that obviously impact everybody. Data collection can be good, it can be bad, right? It can be biased. So tell me how you go about it. Yeah. It's garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> and so we, we say curated by human intelligence scaled through artificial intelligence. And I think this is a really important part of how we do our work, but how AI should be done, which is that you need domain experts, you need humans Mm -hmm. that first actually assess the data in the very early days, because as you're collecting data and you're getting data, you know, we get data from over 45,000 different sources around the world, and it comes in many languages. Government, private, public, everything. Governments, private companies that we license from, um, trade organizations, you know, um, all sorts of, and then they come in many different formats and languages. And you need human experts initially that sort of do the assessment of the data, um, that, that, that document it, that, that map the definition of it, that help create the dictionary. Mm-hmm. And then you start to use artificial intelligence to scale the mapping of that knowledge to better understand the interconnectedness that exists um, through the data. But it always really starts with the human intelligence component that helps with sort of the curation in the beginning. Right. And then you let the machines take over. And this makes your predictive models work better. It makes the knowledge graphs, the systems of sort of how we understand today work significantly better as well. It's a diverse group. I know speaking many different languages. Very. <laughs> yes. But it's good, right? Because you're dealing with a global, pro- you know, global issues. Yeah. I, I always say, um, you know, your team has to resemble the world it's attempting to model. I can hear your commodities background playing into this. What was it about your background in commodities and being in the Wall Street financial community that made, that kind of got you to where you are today and said, all right, there are bigger issues, bigger problems. We need the tools to tackle it. Yeah, I mean, it played a huge role. Um, I was an energy trader. And in the early days of sort of energy trading, if you had an oil producer that um, would come to the market and say, you know, I've discovered oil and I need to now produce this oil and I need some money for it. Mm -hmm. So therefore I need to sell it forward to you. And selling oil two years forward used to be a struggle. By the time I left, you know, oil producers, gas producers, et cetera, could sell oil 10, 20 years forward, long before it was outside the, uh, outside the ground. Mm -hmm. Financial markets enabled that. And, you know, for markets to develop, you need trust, you need baseline understanding, And then people have their relative competitive advantage, right? Because what that does is it drives capital into markets and capital drives innovation and innovation drives very long-term change. Renewable energy, shale oil, shale gas, all of these technologies we take for granted had to be funded some way. And I had seen that agriculture was and still is, frankly, where maybe energy markets were in, if I'm being kind, like the early 90s. <laughs> so <laughs> they were behind, right? They need, they're yeah. very behind. Right. Um, and so, you know, when you think of what happened in COVID last year, during COVID, and all of the shocks the system experienced when, you know, people were saying, are we running out of meat? Uh, you know, why are, you know, certain things just flying off shelves? And is there a shortage? That was really a function of, how short term the food markets actually behave, meaning Mm -hmm. decisions are still being made day to day, week to week by grocers. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you take the most liquid agricultural market in the world, which is corn in the US, you're lucky if you can sell it two years forward, right? So 
that to me is is how do you drive structural change around that? Well, it's interesting you bring up the pandemic too, because there were many people that were forecasting you were going to have some kind of health pandemic for years, and yet it was you know a tragedy, and we were caught off guard. Are we kind of doomed as a society, or as you do the work that you're doing, are we providing the tools that can help people be better prepared? Because when we think about the climate, or we think about food accessibility, I'm hearing from major players in the industry that you know they're looking at maybe a few years or a couple of decades where we could be facing some really difficult situations in feeding the world. We already are, actually. <laughs> yes, I mean, the biggest topic today around the world is food inflation. I right, mean, right. inflation is a major sort of a point of sort of stress for every major economy around the world, including the U.S. But in the U.S., it's a little more transient. Um, in places like Brazil and Russia and China and all around sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East, you're looking at, you know, year-on-year -year food basket prices being up 20, 30, 40 percent right. on top of major currency devaluations. Like, we are not in a good place as a world today as it is when it comes to sort of the fragility of our food systems. Mm -hmm. And to that, you add climate shocks, which is the frequency, you know, because when we think of climate change, there's, you know, sort of like the, the first part is obviously, yes, it's warmer temperatures, but it's what is the distribution of that? Right. And um, what's the volatility? associated right. with sort of the weather patterns themselves. And so predict when predictability goes down, that's never a good thing for society, right? And so I do believe companies like Grow are doing our part in trying to sort of open people's eyes. And that's why I say it's like the story of what on earth is going on. Um, because when you're talking about food security, it is about better understanding our food systems as a real world system, a live, living, breathing system with many different nodes that are interacting and right. thinking of it that way. And when it comes to climate change, it's about better understanding, you know, under different CO2 scenarios, because it's, it's you know, data is the world sharing its experience. And it's a, you know, chronicle of the past, the present and the future. The past and the present are certain. We know them. The future is only probable. Right. And with climate change, it's a set of probable outcomes that we need to manage for. And that requires a huge amount of translation of science right. into actionable insights. Right. And I think we're getting there, but it, it's how do you drive change? How well, do you get people to do that? Well, and that's what I wanted to ask you. I mean, talk to us a little bit about the clients that you work with. I mean, they are getting these data sets from you. They have specific pro, you know, problems that they're trying to, tackling, to tackle, a lot of it with climate change, a lot with food accessibility. Is it making an impact? Are people taking the data and taking the actions to improve the outcome? Yeah, I mean, and let me talk a lot about sort of three segments of, of clients we work with. Um, first is sort of corporates. Mm -hmm. And, and when, when I say corporates, I talk about, you know, very small companies that are trading in one or two agricultural products pretty locally to some of the world's largest corporations um, that are sort of central to our food systems. And what we're doing with sort of the bigger corporations is saying, how do you actually operate differently? How do you understand sort of end to end your supply chains better mm -hmm. and better sort of build resiliency? You know, you increase your margins as a business, but you also increase sort of predictability in terms of a surety of supply and prices that you could produce and, and all of that, right. right? And so it's, it's really sort of about changing operations, helping drive R&D towards where the future of food is going, right? Because you're investing billions of dollars thinking about what's next in my right. pipeline. And you want to be on the right Exactly. Path. Um, the second segment of customers are actually governments mm -hmm. um, because food security is national security. We saw <laughs> and, ag nationalism, right, during the pandemic where people, countries, producer countries didn't export, right, because they had to protect their home and countries. And we're only seeing more of it now. I mean, Argentina just this week extended its ban on beef exports until the end of the year. Yeah. Um, you know, and China's its biggest market. So you have these really big interdependencies, but you know what? The thought of riots within a country is scarier right. than getting more U.S. dollars, which you desperately need. When I, you know, when a country that has a currency crisis bans exports, that tells you everything about sort of the state of um, the world, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're working increasingly with governments around how do you build food secure systems when it's dependent on global trade? 
like we are an interconnected system right. and it's international. How do you do that? And 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 how do you sort of build AI powered, you know, food security systems for nations? Um, so and, you said you have companies, you have the government, and then there, financial institutions. Yeah, <laughs> and with financial institutions, it's sort of um, it's a multitude of things, right? Sometimes it's it's just here's a bunch of data and you're going to do something with it and we have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. But I bet um, they're very interested, right? But but the bigger thing we're doing with financial institutions, which really excites me, is using a subset of the data that we have around climate and understanding. Um, climate phenomenon like drought, floods, climate mm -hmm. volatility, etc. And we're working in bringing together some of the world's largest um, financial players together to launch an entirely new asset class around climate so that we can better not just measure climate risk, but manage it. My, my fear about climate change today is that there's a lot of conversation about what reporting we want, right. but reporting is a tax. And so how do you manage that reporting? How do you manage that risk? So it's one thing to know that you can quantify it, which we can help do. But the second is we need to prepare financial markets mm -hmm. for how that risk will be managed. Otherwise, it is doomsday. It does feel like we're just at the beginning of that, where we're thinking at when you look at a company, it's not just, I don't know, consumer demand or you know, those kind of fundamentals, but we're looking at things like climate change and what impact that ultimately, whether it's the insurance industry, whether it's a food company, right? These are big factors. Yeah. And I, and I say, you know, take clean energy, for example, hydropower. Um, you could invest as an investor and give it a very high E-score mm -hmm. <laughs> because it's clean energy. Right. But what if the, and, and it has great management teams. So say it ticks the boxes on sort of all the components of fundamental investing. But what if the assets of the power plants are located in places that are going to be prone to drought in 10 or 20 years? We have to start thinking about, you know, all of these things holistically and manage better around these risks. So what matters when it comes to the work you're doing? How do you think about it? <laughs> is, there, is our existence at stake? What is it? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, what matters is are we measurably moving the world forward in a mm. positive direction? Um, and are we, you know, doing it in a way that is neutral? I mean, neutrality has mattered so much to me as a company because you cannot be trusted by everyone if you are overly aligned with someone. Mm -hmm. And so we work with all players. We work with competitors. And to me, moving things forward is sort of learn getting systems that don't necessarily fully trust one another to work better together um, because that's how I, I still believe the solution ends up in capital markets mm -hmm. um, but it's how do you sort of drive that change I mean money drives change yes ultimately investment money drives change I want to ask you too though because um, you're using data and we're living in an era where big data where companies that have amassed a lot of data are often looked at wearily <laughs> and skeptically. Um, how do we have to make sure that technology data, you use so much data, is not misused Yeah, and helps society and doesn't hurt society? I mean, trust is a big factor, right? Um, you have to learn to be trusted. Neutrality is the first part of it. Mm -hmm. The second part is transparency. I think for a long time, data companies, AI companies um, sort of live in a world where everything is their secret sauce and nothing can be shared. We as a company have taken a very opposite approach, which is we're very much an open book with those that we work with. We share our modeling methodologies. We, because That's our really peeling sort it of, back. it yeah. is. And, and, and part of it is, is like saying, you know, you sort of want, you know, the ingredients, the recipe, the baked good, and the cherry on top. And you can get any of that combination from us. And most times people want the baked good with the cherry on top. Right. But they feel safe if you have knowledge of what the ingredients are and what the process was, right? And so that's, that, that is really where I think humanizing AI, humanizing data becomes really sort of important. But ultimately, it's up to companies to earn that trust. It, it shouldn't sort of be a given. 
Um, and it's something that you have to just, as I think as CEOs, like uh, we have to actively work on. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm curious because the outcomes, what are you seeing so far with the companies you work with, the government you work with, with financial institutions? I know that's kind of a newer part of, of what you're working on. What are the outcomes so far that are maybe moving the needle in a better direction when it comes to climate change or food distribution or food sustainability? Yeah, I mean, I think if I think about in companies that the change we're driving is the stuff that excites me. I mean, there's lots of stuff that we do that's much, much more sort of like operationally making companies better, which is really important. Right. Um, but the really exciting stuff is helping them rethink sort of future supply chains and how and do you, you see that create, happening. yes, because we work actively with companies of how do you create better sustainable supply chains for healthier foods, which today is a very complicated problem to solve for because healthier and more nutritious foods tend to be produced in smaller quantities and tend to be more expensive. And so how do you sort of crack that affordability code right. in it's the process huge. of going down the sustainability path, right? And that like really sort of excites me because it is bringing the world of sort of food security and climate change into one. Equitability. But really, hopefully, yes, doing it in an equitable way. Because to me, it's not just about having an abundance of food in the world. It's about having an abundance of affordable and nutritious food. And that is a very hard problem to solve for. One last question. In terms of, because you are collecting so much data and you're getting it from so many different sources, is there something that some data points or something that you could get a collaboration that would help you push what you are doing even further in terms of a mission of helping out the climate, helping out our food chain? Yeah, I mean, you know, one area we've been really sort of focused on is, is health and food safety as it relates to climate change. Mm. Um, climate change is going to change the face of human health, just like nutrition, everything from the basics of like allergens, mm -hmm, right. <laughs> you know, and, and allergies to some more complex diseases. Um, and it's also going to change the safety of our foods. So one thing that people don't understand is that extremities in climate volatility means that sometimes you could produce the food, but the food might have higher toxin levels than what is safe for humans to consume. And we know how to model these risks. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things where we're now working on is getting companies to trust us with their data to sort of validate our models because the companies actually sit on the human health data. They sit on the food safety data from what they test in labs. And we're sort of working with them one by one. But how do you sort of collaboratively get them to understand that the collective outcome of understanding this together is mm -hmm. better, more impactful, and actually probably better for everyone's business as well in the process. But right. like, it is to me, the thing that that worries me is the intersection of sort of climate change with food safety and human health. And, and solving for that is going to be critical. Well, listen, we've realized in the last year, right, so much is interconnected and we need everybody's work on these, these massive problems. Um, you're a catalyst for change. We're seeing it. Sarah, thank you so much. <laughs> thank really you for it. having me.